not really debate, but rather a discussion between two professionals on 802.11ax. Some of you may remember some time ago, Jason Hintersteiner entered the ring by saying that 802.11ax is dead on arrival. <laughs> and others of you may know that Devin Aiken toured the country teaching 802.11ax to people everywhere who wanted to hear about it and thus entered the ring. And here today, the two are going to battle it out, two heavyweights in the Wi-Fi space. Number one coming up to present to you his Vado to Don. Yeah, there it goes. Good afternoon, everybody. So yes, last year I got up on this stage and I made the very provocative declaration that 802.11ax is dead. This year, of course, we see 802.11ax access points for multiple vendors, and the vendor that I currently work for, LegoWave, is looking at introducing such products next year. So I'm going to have to revise my statement slightly and tell you, and quote Billy Crystal, and tell you that 802.11ax is mostly dead, <laughs> uh, which means it's a little bit alive. Um, actually, I think Coleman kind of put it best with his presentation when he said the elephant in the room is the client devices, which is basically the argument that I made last year. There are no 802.11 AC Wave 2 client device. There are a handful of 802.11 AC Wave 2 client devices. There are no 802.11 AX client devices. And the question really becomes, will there be 802.11 AX client devices? Yes, the chipset manufacturers, Broadcom and Qualcomm and Intel are making chipsets. But it doesn't come down to a technological argument, it comes down to an economic one. So what do I mean by that? All engineers know one of the first things that you're hopefully taught as an engineer is you get what you measure. Same thing is true in business, especially when you're managing people. You get out of people what you measure. Same thing from technology, you get what you measure. So when I'm testing the performance of the iPhone 12 or 13 or X, VX, whatever that they're coming out with, how am I measuring the performance of this from a Wi-Fi perspective? I'm measuring one device to one access point. For 20 years, we have sold people on upgrading their Wi-Fi based on speed, right? It, you should upgrade from B to G to N to AC because it goes faster. Well, then we hit a wall with 802.11ac because, you know what, we really just can't go faster, right? Because the way I've gone faster for 20 years is that I use math to cheat physics. That's what I do. I cheat the physics and I stuff more bits into the RF stream by using math, right? I got these multiple spatial streams, I'm going to do this band steering stuff, right? In order to, to cheat the physics, right, I make things more and more complicated. The problem when I make things more and more complicated is that they become more and more sensitive to little variations in the environment. I mean, let's be honest, right? 20 years ago, you could have taken an 802.11b access point. You could have literally shut your eyes and set everything randomly in an 802.11b access point, and the damn thing still would have worked, right? Doesn't, doesn't do so nowadays, right? Now, not if you want performance out of your leading edge Wi-Fi 5 or 802.11ac access points. So it's really going to come down to the fact of will clients exist? Right, 802.11ax is supposed to be optimized for IoT devices. But what are IoT devices measured on? Cost, right? And the people who are developing IoT devices and sensors for various things, they're focusing on the sensor technology. They're not focused on the Wi-Fi. They couldn't care about the Wi-Fi. To them, the Wi-Fi is one little component that I want to keep as cheap as possible in order to keep the cost of that whole device as low as possible. So they're going to use the cheapest possible component that they're going to find. So IoT, is IoT going to adopt a brand new 802.11ax chipset when I can go buy a cheapy 2.4 gigahertz N chipset for pennies? Probably not. So again, it comes down to, it's not whether or not technological, yes, obviously technologically there are lots of cool stuff in 802.11ax, right? And the, and the Wi-Fi geek in me looks at it and goes, yeah, that's like some really cool technology. The real question is, is will people and will devices actually adopt it, right? The reality, the way that 802.11ax works is it takes a transmission opportunity and then during that transmission opportunity, it's basically taking over the channel and it's basically directing, you get to talk in this time slot, you get to talk in this time slot, you get to talk in this time slot and you can talk on this sub-channel and that sub-channel and that sub-channel. 
But basically, the AP is actually in charge of the channel during that transmit opportunity. It's like PCF, for those of you who have remembered Devin making us study PCF <laughs> back in the old days. Um, it's PCF on steroids. That's what 802.11ax is. Now, I told you that 802.11ax is mostly dead. So where might it actually have a real play in the marketplace? Is in point-to-point -point and point-to-multipoint, especially point-to-multipoint. Because if you think about the needs of point-to-multipoint networks, I actually control the clients because I control all of those multipoint subscribers. And if they're all talking 802.11ax, that means that I can literally talk to multiple subscribers simultaneously on different subchannels. And so there might be a play for 802.11ax in the point-to-multipoint space. If I want to talk to a lot of different clients simultaneously, if I want to maximize the bandwidth of talking to a lot of different devices for things like wireless surveillance or talking to multiple buildings, or if I'm a WISP operator and I have multiple WISP subscribers off of a tower, then being able to use 802.11ax for that type of application actually might have a play, and there's a lot of really neat stuff that would make that viable. So with that, I'll, I'll invite Devin to, to come up and, and give his little uh, counterpoint, and then we can, we can chat. Up. Oh. I probably don't even need a mic, but I'll, I'll use one. But I do need a chair. Because they told me this was supposed to be casual, so I thought I would bring a chair. How's that? Also brought a piece of paper, so I wouldn't forget anything, because I'm that guy. So thank you. Thank you. So um, everybody give it up. So, so a few things. Um, and, and of course, I've been teaching 11AX for some time, speaking on it. Um, of course, uh, Mr. Coleman's been bouncing around the country and the world teaching on it, and uh, I've heard a lot of different perspectives. Um, there's a few things to keep in mind, I think, um, about it, other than just the clients, which is, of course, it's Achilles' heel and such as that. And the first is that not only do we not have 11AX clients uh, today, but even when we do, uh, the 11 A, B, G, N, A, C clients are going nowhere. Um, they're still manufacturing B clients at a huge rate. It's ridiculous, but it's true. Um, so the old clients are going to stay, and that's going to have its own issues. Um, so we're going to need steering mechanisms. That's going to be a big technical thing. We've got to be able to greenfield uh, the 11AX clients uh, from all the previous FIs. So even if an access point has uh, dual 5 gig, both are 11AX radios, we'll want to use one of them as the fast radio, a VHT, even though it may be a a, uh, an efficient radio with 11AX, high efficiency, uh, we, we may need to use it as a VHT radio or HT radio. So we'll have all the clients, we hope, with steering over onto one radio to go fast and the 11AX HE radios over on the other radio to be efficient. And that green fielding uh, makes sure that the chocolate and the peanut butter doesn't get mixed, right? We, we have chocolate on one radio, peanut butter on the other. If you start mixing them, you get neither speed nor efficiency anywhere. Does that make sense? So um, the old clients aren't going anywhere. Steering mechanisms are very important. Another, another couple that kind of play together, uh, and Coleman uh, uh, touched on this a little bit too, is the POE issue. But it's more than just the power that's required. Um, certainly there is that. If you're doing 4x4s, four four dual radios, you can keep this under an AT budget. But once you get to 8x8s, um, eight eight, multiple 8x8s, eight eight, you're pushing into a, um, a, a BT budget. You know, and, and then with BT, there'll be type 3, type 4, 60 watt, 90 watt. And it won't be long before we'll see multi-radio units, three, four, five radio access points, that whether they're four by four or they're uh, eight by eights. And when you get to that point, we're going to be pushing the maximum even of a type three BT moving on up into a type four. You build it, they'll come. You give them POE, they'll use it. Um, we already see some BT uh, access points out there. For example, Ubiquities XG has BT printed right on it. So... Uh, and it's got five radios in it, four Wi-Fi and a BLE, so that's, that's an issue. And the cabling, 
Uh, Cat Cat 6 won't cut it. Cat 6A is going to be necessary, solid copper, because of the heating. If you start pulling a full AT budget, uh, you're going to uh, have an issue uh, with heat on Cat 6. So we're going to need uh, we're going to need Cat 6A at that point. And certainly, when you push up into a BT budget, you're going to get really hot, and it starts compounding. Uh, you know, 4% for every, uh, I think it's every 10 degrees Celsius over ambient 20 degrees Celsius. So that gets quickly shortening your cable length maximums. So uh, PoE switches are going to be very, very important um, in the near future if you're wanting to run not just high-end, uh, you know, 8 by 8s for whatever reason you might want to do that, but, but also multi-radio units. <clears throat> Uh, one thing to consider is that 11AX, it's, this is my kind of neutral opinion of 11AX, and I do have an opinion. Um, I'm neither uh, super for it or super against it. I'm kind of right down the middle right now, and I usually fall to one side or the other. It's dead or it's awesome. But on, on this technology, there's many new pieces, whether it's coloring or uh, adaptive CCA algorithms. We're you know, trying to figure out if that's going to have any value. I think multi-user MIMO uplink and downlink is stupid. It's not just bad, it's stupid. And, and so you can quote me on that. It's recorded. Play it all you want. And so I've said that 10 million times. And so I think OFDMA is, 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 has the potential to be fantastic technology. It's already used in cellular, so we know it's proven. And we expect that it will be quite good as long as we can greenfield it with steering mechanisms. The key here is, uh, in, in truth, today, and probably for the next two, three, four years, 11AX is unnecessary. And so 11AC works just fine in the vast majority of networks if it's designed properly, validated properly, it, it'll be just fine. So, and of course that same mentality of design and validation will carry forward into the 11AX world. At some point, I promise you, everybody in this room, if you stay in Wi-Fi, you and your company will buy 11AX. And the reason is because it will become all that's available. You won't have a choice. So you will upgrade now or you will upgrade later. You will upgrade. And vendors can say, oh, if you buy it now, it's got bugs. And other vendors say, no, ours works fine and we have customers, blah, 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 tastes great, less filling. Um, it's all marketing to me. Uh, but will it work? Yes, of course it'll work. It must work because that's where we're going and we don't have a choice really. Uh, the biggest challenge 11AX has is not the clients or lack thereof. They will come, um, but it's marketing hype. You need 10 gigs. You need dual 5 gigs. Um, it's going to revolutionize your company, your business, your plumbing, blah, blah, blah. It'll cook your dinner. It won't. And so the marketing, it, it, I hate the, this one piece of marketing. It's a Wi-Fi switch. Everything's a switch uh, with marketing. Um, I think that... Um, you know, as long as you do a good design and validation and you, more importantly, build a good customer relationship between the VAR and the, uh, the customer or the vendor and the VAR and the customer, I think those things far trump the incremental technology that is 11AX, which, again, is just an incremental change that's going to take time to take any advantage of. But at some point, of course, it, it, will, uh, it will start to have advantages. How's that? So... Um, so, I, I agree with you on the power budget stuff, and I also agree with you on multi-user MIMO. I mean, I declared multi-user MIMO <laughs> was dead last year. I still actually believe multi-user MIMO was dead. Could it be made to work? Yes. You need the vast majority of clients to support it, just as with AX, in order to get the real benefits of it, you need the vast majority of clients on your network to actually be supporting 802.11ax and giving, yeah. being able to support those sub-channels for OFDMA. And what we've seen with that is even if your clients do support it, uh, the, the overhead, as, as you support it more and more, the overhead of sounding on the channel goes up and up and up and to the point where it's a losing proposition. Um, Multi-user MIMO has, has use cases, but there's a, there are a minority of use cases. For example, it, it would be useful if you had three set-top boxes in your house that are all within range of your Wi-Fi router that, and they don't move um, and you could control the sounding interval. Um, sure, it works fine, but in an enterprise where you have hundreds if not thousands of moving clients and the sounding is continuous, you can eat up lots of your channel airtime doing exactly nothing. So, so I agree, multi-user MIMO is just dead, stupid technology. Uh, so is there any... Well, certainly for, certainly for Wi-Fi, for point-to-point, yeah, yeah. for point-to-multi-point, point point, I should say. Yeah. Um, I do know I, uh, there is viability for, I mean, I know Cambium already has a product that's utilizing multi-user MIMO. Yeah. 
Um, my own company is looking at a multi, you know, looking at 802.11 AX for primarily on the OFDMA side, but you know, could, could potentially use it for multi-user MIMO. But again, that's fixed point to fixed point, yes. which is a different story than fixed to mobile. Yes. So, so is there any questions for, for us? Yeah, we've got a few minutes. If you guys have questions about 802.11ax. Piece of meat you can throw in the ring and <laughs> watch us slaughter each other. I can't see. Uh, Anybody, questions? Posers? If, if there's no, no, oh no, Coleman has a question. Oh, of course We're he does. We're hosed. <laughs> <laughs> It, it actually um, has some, we'll call it minority of similarity. Um, PCF mode is uh, where your access point switches over to a deterministic polling mode, uh, but, but DCF is the de standard deterministic method that we've been using, DCF, uh, EDCA, and so on. Uh, and uh, 11AX uses OFDMA, and so its multi-client uh, mechanism happens during a TIXOP, just like we heard earlier. It happens only during a TIXOP. So its control of the medium and any similarities to PCF is during a TIXOP. But other than that, it's, it's still a free-for-all. It's still EDCA. It's a QoS-based contention environment. So it's, there are some similarities, but it's only within the TIXOP one by the access point. I can say I sure hope that PCF mode and HICA mode that's based, was based on it and anything like that is debt. I hope it is, but I, <laughs> I can't speak for the IEEE or uh, Wi-Fi Alliance. Uh, maybe you know something I don't. Oh, well, I, I haven't seen anybody implement PCF in, in a very, very long time. So any, any other questions? We have three minutes. So Yeah, so please. Here we go. Does it oh. benefit mobile devices? For the, to the time, time, yeah. time to wake? Mm -hmm. um, basically, it, it, it's a power saving mode, uh, which means that basically it, it gives a little more efficiency in terms of when mobile devices can turn the radios off and when they can turn themselves back on uh, in order to, to, to pull and receive messages uh, if there's anything waiting for them. So it's, it's kind of the next generation of improvement on, on power save. Yeah, target wake time um, was introduced in 11AH for IoT, and the purpose of it is to uh, allow clients to sleep for longer periods of time. Not necessarily really long periods of time. It could be. Um, when you have clients sleeping for very long periods of time, let's say hours or days or longer for whatever purposes, um, maybe it's a sensor that wakes up every two days and sends a, a couple of uh, frames to the cloud and what, you know, for a status update on temperature, whatever it is. Um, uh, hello, hello, there we are, thank you. Uh, so when you have a situation like that, you can run into some weird problems. Like for example, the client wakes up after, let's say, two days. Um, and what happened to its DHCP lease, right? The lease might have been 24 hours, might have been uh, eight hours, and it has to now wake up, do it, it realizes it's lost its IP, or maybe it doesn't know that it lost its IP, and it just assumes it's good, and so now it has an IP conflict, or maybe it has to go get a new IP address, and that, that is burning all the power that it saved by sleeping, doing a DHCP renew. So there's some unknowns. Maybe we need to static the client IPs. Maybe we don't. Um, maybe there needs to be a maximum time it sleeps. There's problems to consider like uh, time synchronization. Uh, the time sync in Wi-Fi is 100 parts per million. So um, if you do the math on that, you'll see that if it sleeps for hours, it could wake up at completely the wrong time. It's got eight schedules that it can do, and so it may be waking up uh, 30 seconds after or before it's supposed to because the time sync is off, um, simply because the clocks in the radios are not that accurate, which is why we sync them every 100 kilomicroseconds or every 100 time units. So that's the clocks are, are sucky. They're cheap. So we do the best we can. And so um, there's all kind of issues you could run into with, with a uh, target wake time. No, I, I would tend to concur that, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure people are thinking that devices would sleep for hours or days, but, right. but certainly, you know, right now when we talk about power saving, we're talking about, you know, we're still in the millisecond kind of yeah, regime. That's right. Right. And now we're talking, I think it's more envisioned for like seconds or minutes as opposed to, you know, 
milliseconds. However, you know, issues about DHCP leases and what happens if it wakes up and the AP is down and it's no longer there and it's yeah. lost its association, or the AP has timed it out because it hasn't heard from it in a while um, and automatically just kind of kicks it off because it just that's assumed a, it left the yeah, network. That's right. right? That's you know, there, there are all right sorts there. of, there are going to be all sorts of issues with that. So with thank that, you. Thank you. any other questions? I think we're good on time. I think we're good on oh, time. So now we're over. thank you, everybody. Thank you.